بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome ladies and gentlemen to uh, this lecture As you know this is uh, This lecture is uh, entitled uh, uh, This is lecture uh, 10 And inshallah in this lecture we are going to talk about Language and the brain In other words The, the connection between language and the brain or what is known as neurolinguistics uh, just a, a short introduction about neurolinguistics uh, uh, we 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 must be aware that neurolinguistics is one is a sub category of uh, applied linguistics is one of the important uh, uh, you know, components of applied linguistics, which has been uh, uh, recently uh, studied by many researchers. So uh, it's a big research area, and there is a, a sort of uh, 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 lots of uh, research going on right now. So neurolinguistics, as I have just uh, briefly mentioned, deals with the study of the relationship between language and the brain. So here we have two important aspects that this part or this aspect of applied linguistics deal with. These two main aspects are language, obviously, and br brain. In other words, this part or this subcategory of applied linguistics deals with the interrelationship between language and the brain how language is a brain how, how language is processed due to some functions of the brain okay so it's about studying the relationship between language and the brain for example one of the key areas, one of the key things that neurolinguistics look at or looks at is the, uh, 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 you know, language areas as we are going to see in the, uh, in the next slides. So there are images showing the two parts of the brain, left and right hemisphere, and uh, we are going in this lecture, we are going to focus on the left hemisphere since language or the area which is in charge which is responsible for language production is located and is believed to be located in the left hemisphere not the right hemisphere each part or each hemisphere is responsible for doing certain functions so right now since we are dealing with language since language is uh, our uh, you know um, is our uh, concern so we are going to focus on the left hemisphere rather than right hemisphere such images have shaded areas which indicate the general locations of those language functions involved in speaking and listening so within the left hemisphere we can divide it or we can label it into certain areas so some areas of the left hemisphere is or uh, some areas are in charge of speaking listening reading and writing okay so we are talking about left, left hemisphere and within the hem the left hemisphere uh, there are areas which are responsible for for example speech production listening writing and and uh, uh, and reading for example okay but the most important two skills which require higher kind of higher uh, uh, you know uh, thinking skills are speaking and listening because these are called uh, you know uh, very difficult skills such image helps to determine where language disabilities for normal users must be by finding areas with specific damage in the brains of people who have identifiable language disabilities. So such images as you see in the book, 
in uh, in this chapter which is about language and the brain uh, we will see these areas which will indicate and which will differentiate between normal brain and abnormal brain uh, and abnormal brain we will see the differences so we can uh, you know determine if there are any sort of disabilities by looking at different uh, uh, images of brain okay now we are talking about language areas in the brain again don't get confused we are focusing right now on the left hemisphere since language is located in this part of the brain so when, when, when we talk about language of brain we have three main areas the first area is called Broca's area and it was identified by a French surgeon a French scientist who who used to be a surgeon his name is Paul Broca Paul Broca okay so what did he found uh, it's it's known as anterior uh, speech of cortex that's where it's it's located uh, and uh, according to Broca he reported that the damage in this part of the brain okay could cause difficulty in producing spoken language okay so this is what you know um, if there is any shortage or if there is any disability in this part of area in this part of the brain in this area this would lead to you know causing some difficulties in producing in speaking the learner or the the person or the individual will not be able to produce normal uh, language in other words he or she might not be able to speak he or she might understand things but as as reverse they will not be able to produce to utter language so damage to the right hemisphere had no such effect as I have just mentioned since we are dealing with left hemisphere not right hemisphere right hemisphere you know has other functions like art for example and this is uh, we un, uh, you know this is out of our topic today uh, also or in addition to this uh, Broca found that language ability is located in the left hemisphere and since then it has been treated as indication that Broca's area is involved in the generation of spoken language so this is one important aspect that we need to we need to know that Broca's area or uh, yeah uh, the, the Broca's area is in charge of producing spoken language in addition to generating language okay let's talk about the second area which is known as Wernix area Wernix area uh, this area was discovered by uh, another physician okay but he's German okay uh, the previous one one uh, you know Prokes was a French and one uh, was a, a German phys physician so uh, it and it's known it's known as a posterior speech cortex so it it uh, it's located uh, at the back of cortex you know this part of brain which is called cortex in the right in the left hemisphere consists of two let's say speech or two areas okay we have the posterior which is located at the back of the cortex and we have when we have the anterior cortex so uh, what did this scientist uh, find he reported that the damage in this part of the brain which is known as which was known later on as Wernick's area so he found that among patients who had speech comprehension difficulties so he compared what did he do in order to discovering uh, 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 this area he compared two brains okay abnormal brains and normal brains and when he looked at the patients okay he looked at the brains of patients 
and he looked at this area and based on it he came to a conclusion that those patients had speech comprehension difficulties because of you know a disability in this part of the brain which was known later on as Wernick's area okay so the findings confirm that the left hemisphere location of language ability and led to the view that this area is involved in the understanding of speech so these two areas are you know uh, vital areas in language production as well as in comprehension language the main difference between these two areas uh, as I have just mentioned and I'm repeating what I have uh, just mentioned now is that Broca's area is responsible for producing spoken language for speaking whereas Wernick's area is in charge of comprehending language understanding speech okay so these two areas would complement each other so for the normal person who can produce the language as well as understand it we can assume that this person is has uh, you know has no disability in neither areas the third area is known as motor cortex area and this is the third language areas in the brain and uh, it's the area that generally controls movement of the muscles for example for moving our hands in order uh, so this area which w uh, would uh, enable us as normal people to move feet for example to move uh, uh, hands arms etc it's located uh, in a place uh, which is very close to Broca's area this one which is uh, which is located uh, in the uh, anterior speech uh, uh, cortex it it also controls the articulatory muscles of the face or jaws tongue larynx okay so it's also a very very important area in the brain which controls uh, some aspects of language production okay now we come to what is known as localization okay so localization the localization view based based on these areas the three areas we have been talking about we can conclude we can, can we can draw a conclusion that specific aspects of language ability can be accorded and produced in specific locations in the brain and this is what what is known as the localization so we uh, we uh, we know that we know now that uh, the the parts of brain which is in charge of uh, for example uh, producing uh, spoken language this is called the Broca's area the parts of the brain which is in charge of comprehending language is known as Wernick's area we also came to uh, or we uh, you know we uh, we knew now, now that uh, the parts of the brain which is in charge of controlling the articulatory uh, muscles of the face is called a uh, motor cortex area so this is once we know you know the places or what does each area is in charge of this or in charge uh, uh, when you know that uh, different functions are or can be uh, achieved in different uh, uh, in different uh, places in different locations this is called loca uh, localization so this is a very this is a technical term it's used in this sense so localization means that every part of the brain every area is in charge of certain functions this view has been used to suggest that the brain activity is involved in hearing a word understanding it then saying it in other words that the localization view or localization in general okay would 
which supports the idea of the importance of integrating these different functions together. Okay, so uh, we can't, for example, uh, I mean, uh, hearing a word is not is not sufficient to produce a language. Okay, or just understanding a word is not enough in its own to 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 produce a language or to be good in language. You need to hear it. You need to understand it. Then vocalization. Uh, then vocalize it or utter it or saying it. Okay, and this is very interesting because uh, each part or, no, or each one of these three, let's say, functions can be achieved in one part or one areas the, uh, uh, in one of the uh, one of the areas we have just mentioned so for example hearing a word okay in order to hear a word this should be placed in you know procus area in order to understand a word this should be done with the help of or this should be achieved in uh, as you know uh, wernix area in order to say it Okay, this should be done, you know, or should be, uh, it should be processed in motor cortex uh, uh, area. So this is very, very important, as I have just mentioned, uh, and understanding that language goes through, or in language, goes through these three stages. Okay, we have these three functions, hearing, understanding and then articulating it or saying it okay okay now we come to tongue tips and slips so that the tongue of the tongue phenomena what is it it's a phenomena in which we feel that some word or words is just eluding us that we know the word but just we, uh, you know, uh, won't come to the surface, okay? So, in internally, we know the word, okay, what is the right word, but for some reasons, because of the slips in the tongue, or because of, you know, tongue, uh, tongue tips or tongue slips, you know, it didn't come out, it didn't come out, it didn't, it didn't come to the, to the surface, okay? So, it Sometimes happens with uncommon words and names. Sometimes may happen unconsciously, okay, it's j because of just a slip in uh, in the tongue, or particularly in uh, you know uh, yeah, in the tongue. It suggests this phenomena suggests that word storage system may be organized on the basis of some phonological information, and that some words in this tool are more easily retrieved than others. I think that's, that's obvious. The tip of the tongue phenomena also, uh, you know, when we make mistakes in this retrieval process, there are often strong phonological similarities between the target word we are trying to say and the mistake we actually produce. And I think this is the main reason for, you know, for falling into this, uh, uh, let's say, um, mistake. It's not a, you know, it, it, it happens, okay, uh, but as, I, as I've just mentioned, this mistake might be unconscious. So it's not, you know, uh, it's unintentional uh, uh, sort of mistakes. Particularly with those words, which have uh, phonological similarities, and I will get some examples now. Look at this example, fire distinguisher. So instead of saying fire extinguisher, okay, someone might say distinguisher, okay, or motivation, okay, instead of saying meditation, instead of saying meditation, okay. So the speaker knows definitely the right word, okay, but sometimes, you know, because of the phonological similarities, he or she might say or might utter, uh, might utter the, the other word or other words which look 
like similar phonologically, not semantically. Okay, so slips of the tongue, it's another type of speech error producing expressions such as a long, shorty story. This is another example. Instead of saying, make a long story short, we might say, or someone might say, a long, shorty story. That's, this, this just happened because of the, you know, uh, you know, tongue slip. Okay? So, the second type of slips, are, uh, uh, the second type of slip is called a, a slip of the brain. So, it's not a slip in the tongue, it's rather called a slip in the brain or a slip of the brain. So, it's another type of speech error referring to word change or word substitution as similar, but inappropriate word is used instead of the target word that the speaker wants to address or deliver. It happens as a result of a sound being carried over from one word to the next. For example, instead of saying, as in black boxes, okay, or instead of saying black boxes, he or she might say black boxes. So instead of saying boxes, okay, the speaker might say boxes, okay. That simply, this is not a tongue slip, this is called the brain slip. So we substitute the word boxes instead of boxes. Using the word depression instead of recession, for example. So we replace the target word which is recession and we replace it with depression. So the meant word is recession, but for this slip of the brain, we might say, or someone might say, depression. Using the word tub instead of cup, this is also another example. So a tub of tea instead of saying a cup of tea. So the target word is cup of tea, and tub of tea might be used uh, instead, uh, instead of it. So it involves an interchange of, number one, a change in word final sounds. Number two, word initial sound slips. So the slip of the brain, okay, might happen, okay, with the interchange of either both or one of these two things, either a change in word final sounds, the final letters of the word, for example, there might be phonological similarities in the final sounds, or there might be phonological similarities in the initials of the word. Let's say the initial, uh, the, the initial uh, letters, for example, or the initials, okay, not the final sound. And I gave you some examples. For example, the word tap and cup. Here we have, this is an example for an interchange in word initial sound slips. So tap, cup, as, as you see. Such errors are argued to be a result of trying to organize and generate linguistic messages. So, you know, these mistakes uh, are normal. Uh, are normal. Uh, they might be caused by any person, okay? And in, in, in order to fix it or deal with it, uh, uh, normally uh, people or speakers come back and replace it with the right word. Another type of slip is, uh, uh, is known as uh, the slip of the ear. So it's another type of speech error. It provides some clues to how the brain tries to make sense of the auditory signal it receives. Using the word gray day to be interpreted initially as common on the weather. But after some confusion was uh, reinterpreted as grade A. Here the speaker is talking about eggs, not weather. Okay, that's just, I mean, this misunderstanding happened because of the, you know, this is slip. So instead of saying grade A, instead of saying grade A. So it took, you know, the hearer some time to understand that 
what is meant by the speaker, okay, or the speaker is talking about, you know, is talking about eggs, okay, not, not the weather. Okay, that that happened just because of what, because of the uh, interchange in in um, in this word. So grade A, grade A, grade A. Okay, so using the word great ape to mean gray tape. This is also another another example. So the ear, okay, might hear, you know, some words and interpret it in a certain way. Okay, sometimes it's very hard to understand a word out of its context. In order to make sure that what the speaker is targeting, or what does the speaker mean, we as receivers, or as we hearers, we need to understand the whole context. Okay, so we can't understand something that's taken out of its context, particularly with words which are phonologically similar or have some level of phonological similarities. Okay, now we come to some types of, you know, uh, disabilities that might happen with, uh, though with some people who have some linguistic problems, either in... Uh, for example, in understanding language or comprehending the language. Okay, so one of the, let's say, uh, one, one type of uh, language disorders is known as aphasia. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's known as, or it's defined as an impairment of language function due to localized brain damage that leads to difficulty in understanding or producing linguistic forms. So, the aphasic or a, an aphasic person, okay, it's the person or it's someone who has an impairment in language functioning, okay, and it, he or she's a person who has a difficulty in understanding a language as well as, and, and or, okay, uh, has a problem in producing linguistic forms, okay? So someone or, uh, I mean, an aphasic person might have both of these problems or both of these two uh, disabilities or just one of them, okay? So it's not necessary to have both of these disabilities at the same time, okay? One of them might be, uh, might happen to, uh, to the, to an individual. So, let me repeat it again. Aphasia is an impairment of language function due to localized brain damage that leads to difficulty in understanding and or producing linguistic forms. So here we have disability regarding understanding language as well as producing language. Stroke is the most common cause of aphasia. This is very, very important. It's something that we need to no, the aphasia, generally speaking, happens as a result of stroke, as a result of brain stroke. Someone who is aphasic often has interrelated language disorders, okay? In that difficulties in understanding can lead to difficulties in projection, as I have just mentioned. So most aphasic uh, patients have interrelated, have, you know, interconnected problems or difficulties in understanding. And the problem of understanding language will lead to difficulties in production. And I think that's normal, that's logical. If I don't understand something, I will not be able to, you know, to produce it. And I think these two skills, okay, are interrelated okay and both or and the latter happens as a result of you know uh, the former so what, ab what about the types we have three types of aphasia the first one is called Broca's aphasia it's called motor aphasia motor is in charge of what when I say motor motor means movement so comprehension is much better than production 
So this aphasia, okay, or you know, patients who, who have a problem with bronchial aphasia suffer from production. Okay, they might comprehend language but are not able to produce language. It's characterized by a substantially reduced amount of speech because they can't produce language, so they have very, very, they are not good in making language at all. Distorted articulation and slow, okay, they cannot articulate, and if they articulate something, this articulation of language is supposed to be very distorted, damaged, okay, and often effortful speech. So even if they can speak, they will speak very difficult, uh, you know, uh, they will speak it, I mean, even if they have the ability to speak something, they will speak, they will, uh, I mean, they will say it or they will utter it with a great, with extensive amount of effort. It involves omission or deletion of functional morphemes, such as articles, pronouns, and consists of only lexical morphemes, such as content, nouns, and verbs. So, you know, all functional morphemes will be, you know, deleted. And they will only keep, you know, keywords, like for example, I, X, okay, here, you know, uh, articles, there are some deletion, there are some deletion, uh, deletions of articles and the pronouns. So, I, X, and eat, and drink, coffee, breakfast, as you see, you only understand these content words, but there are definitely an omission of some you know, important articles and pronouns in this sentence. Okay, the second type of aphasia is known as Wernick's aphasia. So what is it? It's language disorder that results in difficulties in auditory comprehension. So they have or they suffer, you know, uh, they have a problem or this, they are suffering from understanding the language okay and obviously this might lead to you know this type of aphasia which is uh, which is a difficulty in production of the language so here this is this is uh, a difficulty in auditory comprehension it's also called sensory aphasia it involves someone suffering from this disorder can actually produce very fl very fluent speech which is often difficult to make sense of. So, uh, I mean, such patients are really hard to be, to, be, to be understood because they might utter something which are not totally, you know, uh, aware of. So they might say something, okay, which they haven't themselves understood it, you know, fully. It involves finding difficulties in finding correct words. So they might say just words which are not, you know, which which may be sometimes meaningless. For example, I can talk all of the things I do and part of the part I can do all right, but I can't tell from the other people. So as you see here, here we have sentences. Okay, we have words, content words, we have pronouns, we have, as you see, uh, uh, pr uh, articles, but, you know, they are very hard to be understood. The third type of, or the third type of aphasia is known as uh, conduction aphasia. It's much less common type of aphasia compared to the previous two types of aphasia. Uh, individuals suffering of this, uh, from this order sometimes mispronounce words but typically don't have articulation problems. So they can articulate it, okay? Except they might have, you know, they might uh, have problems with mispronouncing words. They are fluent, but may have disrupted rhythm because of pauses and hesitation. So they have very frequent pauses. They might stop at any time. They might stop at the middle of the word, okay? Uh, and they have lots of hesitations. Comprehension of spoken words is normally good. Okay, they don't. They are fine with comprehending words, with understanding language. Yet the task of repeating a word or phrase 
create a major difficulty. So they can understand it, but they can't repeat it. Okay? Difficulties in speaking can be uh, accompanied by difficulties in writing as well. So, such patients have a problem or have a major difficulty in repeating words or phrases as well as difficulties in, in, in writing what they hear. So, this difficulties or this difficulty is always a result of injury to the left hemisphere. Uh, okay, <clears throat> now we come to what is known as uh, uh, decotic listening. So what is decotic listening? It's an experimental technique and it should demonstrate the left hemisphere dominance of language for syllable and word processing. It establishes a fact that anything experienced on the right hand side of the body is a processed in the left hand hemisphere. So everything that is processed in the right hand or in the, you know, uh, in the right hand side of the body is in fact processed in the, you know, in the right, in the left hemisphere of the body. Okay? And anything on the left side of the body is processed in the right hemisphere of the mind. Okay? So that's how it works. So now let's come to, uh, yeah, uh, how, you know, how, how the two parts of, or how the two hemispheres work together. In fact, the two hemispheres are really inter, in, interrelated. So the language signal, that's how, you know, the language goes on and how language is processed in the brain. So the language signal received through the left ear in the first sent to the right hemisphere and then has to be sent to the to the left hemisphere for processing language again you know language is considered as signals okay which are normally uh, you know uh, re received by the left ear which you know which which uh, which uh, which, uh, which, uh, which can be uh, sent to the right hemisphere and then has to be sent again to the left hemisphere for processing language. This is non-direct route. Takes longer, or this is non-direct non route, okay, which takes longer than a linguistic signal received through the right ear. So we have two kind of routes. We have the direct route and non-direct route. The direct, the, the direct route of language, uh, when the right ear hears a language, because it will go directly to the left hemisphere of the brain. Okay, whereas if the language, or if the if the language goes first through the left ear, it will go first to the right hemisphere and to the right hemisphere and it will be sent back again to the right hemisphere. Let me, let me repeat it. If we hear something, or if the, if, the left hear, uh, if the left ear hears something, this will go to the right hemisphere, and it will be sent back to the left hemisphere. Since the, you know, the left hemisphere is in charge of decoding the language. So it's, it's like the storage is, you know, uh, it's the place where language should be processed. Okay? So if we hear something through the left ear, this process is called this process is called non-direct route. On the other hand, if we hear something through the right ear, this process is called direct route because it will go directly to the left hemisphere and language will be processed. Okay, as you see here, on the other hand, the right hemisphere have a primary responsibility for processing incoming signals that are non-linguistic. Non-verbal sounds such as traffic noises are recognized via the left ear. 
meaning they are processed faster via the right hemisphere. So, so we, are, we are talking about linguistic signals, okay? Because we might hear other things that are not linguistic. So the right ear might process these sounds, okay, quicker than the left ear. Sorry, uh, might, uh, so uh, non-verbal sounds like, I mean, those such non-linguistic sounds might be recognized by the left ear, okay, uh, you know, uh, and they will be processed faster because they are not, they, they don't need to be sent to the, to the, to the, to the, to the left hemisphere. Okay. Accordingly, the basic distinction to be, uh, I mean, to be bet between uh, 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 analytic processing, such as recognizing the smaller details of sounds, words, phrases, or phrase structures in rapid, sequ uh, in rapid sequ uh, sequence, which are to be done in the left brain, while holistic processing, okay, such as identifying more general structure in language and experience can be done in the right brain. Okay? So we cannot isolate right brain, argue, uh, claiming that the right brain has no function at all in the process of language. No, it has some, you know, it deals with the holistic processing, okay, but not the analytical processing of language. I think there, there is no doubt that the, the analytical processing of language takes a place in the left hemisphere. On the other hand, the holistic processing, such as identifying more general structure, such as, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, general structure of language and experience, this can be placed in the right brain or right hemisphere. Okay, now let's come to the final thing, which is known as a critical period. This is very, very, very important. Uh, so, the apparent specialization of the left hemisphere for language is described as uh, l uh, lateralization. So we say, uh, for example, if we say that uh, the left hemisphere is a produced or is in charge of producing and uh, uh, comprehending language, this is this considered as, or this is this can be considered as lateralization, okay, or hemisphere lateralization. It's also known as one-sidedness, okay? It's thought that lateralization begins in early childhood, in the, in very, very, uh, very uh, early uh, age. During childhood, there is a period when the human brain is most ready to receive input and learn a particular language. This is called sensitive period for language acquisition. But also, but it's also known as a critical period, okay? And there is a very great, there is, there is, uh, you know, a very, very, uh, there is a debate, uh, you know, taking place among uh, uh, scholars uh, between, uh, I mean, there is a debate between uh, scholars. Uh, uh, so there is no specific sort of, age when it's gonna when, when when it's exactly the critical age when 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 it's uh, or when um, when should it exactly start and when should it exactly finish okay but they all have consensus that it takes a place you know in the early years of life okay before 10 years old okay uh, uh, it's argued that the critical period lasts from birth to uh, puberty, okay? Well, it's difficult for a child to acquire a first language after this period. It may happen acquiring a second, a first language after this period, but this is very, very rare, okay? Language is acquired as a native language in this period, okay? Or during this period, which is known as a critical period. Uh, during childhood, when a human brain is ready to receive the input and learn particular a particular language, okay, uh, with certain accent, for example, 
okay and after that he or she will be considered as a native speaker for that language that's all what I want to say regarding this chapter regarding this lecture about neurolinguistics which is known as or which deals with the interrelationship between language and the brain see you in the next lecture I wish you all the best Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.